The history of Madison Water Utility is as unique as the city itself. Almost as soon as Madison was founded, there was talk of the need for a centralized water system to deal with fires that plague so many growing cities. But it would take a forward-thinking UW undergrad and his unusual chemistry experiments in 1880 to really get people's attention. His name was Magnus Swenson. The history of the water utility starts with this extraordinary individual. Magnus Swenson came to the city government and said, you have a serious problem here. You've got polluted, dangerous water. You need to do something about it. Madisonians got their drinking water from hand-dug backyard wells and thought little of it until Swenson started knocking on their doors and running purity tests on their water for his senior thesis. People had backyard wells, they had backyard cesspools, often only a few feet apart. And people figured, well, you know, that the couple of feet between the cesspool and the, uh, and the water well, the national filtration system of the ground, it, it will get rid of all the bad things. Well, obviously, that wasn't the case, and that's why people were getting sick. At the time, Swenson's tests were revolutionary. Experiments in Europe connecting diseases like cholera and typhoid to drinking water were far from common knowledge in Madison, and purity tests unheard of. Emanuel Swenson was ahead of his time in that the information about organic matter um, and ammonia from wastewaters, um, polluting water as an indicator of risk was considered a radical concept. At the State Lab of Hygiene, chemist Dr. Sharon Long recreates one of Swenson's 1880 experiments. He would have taken a solution of potassium permanganate and put two drops in the sample. And then you would wait overnight to see if the color faded, turned yellow, or became clear. So if it faded just to this pale pink, the water was considered still safe. If it reacted with the organic matter until it was yellow, that would indicate that the water was un had organic matter at a level that was unsafe to drink. I mean, it's still a good test. A good test, but a hard sell for many prominent members of the community. Swenson declared that 96% of the city's well water was unfit to drink. People did not want to hear that their water was dirty. They, he had so many bricks and, and blocks thrown at him and dogs sicked on him, he needed a police escort. And there was a lot of um, pushback from the citizenry, you know, but, but you know, show us the bodies, you know, we, you know, we've been drinking this water. It may have been hard for some citizens to accept, but the press latched on and eventually the public was swayed. Madison would create a citywide waterworks. I think then, as today, having the university in Madison, you've got folks that are on the cutting edge of science, keeping up on what's going on around the globe, um, you know, as Magnus Swenson did then. In a city surrounded by lakes, the source to supply this new city water system may have seemed obvious. For a city, any city on a large body of water, in those days it was common practice to use the lake water or river water because you just put a pipe in the lake and start pumping. But there was a problem. The lake was polluted, and everybody in Madison knew that. No city sewer, no garbage pickup meant trash, and the contents of chamber pots were dumped in the streets, and that wasn't all. There were the animals, and Madison probably had about a 1,000 horses. Many families kept livestock, cows, pigs, chickens, each of these animals left little deposits every day, usually in the street. It probably amounted to about 10 tons of manure every day. And consider that Madison drains either north to Lake Mendota or south to Lake Monona. After a heavy rain, a lot of this stuff on the surface would be washed into the lakes. But one of the worst problems came from Madison's most well-to-do neighborhoods. So the wealthier families in town started installing water closets in their house. Now, when you flush the toilet, that stuff goes down the drain and it has to go somewhere. So what happened was the homeowner would also build a sewer from his house down to the lake. So now you're getting untreated, raw, sanitary wastewater going straight into the lake. And long before you got to the lake, you could smell it. But unlike many cities, Madison had another option. Under the city, there was a deep, productive sandstone aquifer. And not only that, but it was an artesian aquifer, which meant that in many parts of the city, you could drill a well down into the sandstone, and the water would rise to the surface and flow naturally from the artesian pressure. 
Even though the business community still pushed for lake water, which had fewer minerals to clog up the all-important steam engines of the day, Magnus Swenson's experiments were still fresh on people's minds. The public insisted on the aquifer. They prevailed, and the city decided to use groundwater instead of lake water. The city would dig wells hundreds of feet down into the aquifer, install miles worth of water main, and connect homes and businesses across Madison, unless it hired someone else to do it. Once the city decided it needed a central water system, well, that's when big business got interested, and a Milwaukee firm uh, started sniffing around for the contract. The Milwaukee firm had offered to install the water system for free. Uh, all it wanted was a 25-year exclusive franchise. Standing in the way was a Madison bookbinder and new common council member named John Heim. John Heim, at his very first common council meeting in May of 1881, thought, you know, a water system is too important to give to a private company. And John Heim got the coalition on the common council to block it. And in August of 1881, the council unanimously voted that something as important as a public water system had to be owned and operated by the city of Madison. It was, it was a very strong statement that without John Heim probably wouldn't have happened. So the city turned to that bookbinder to lead the creation of its new Madison Waterworks. He would serve for 28 of the next 29 years as superintendent. And Madison became a model of municipal ownership for water utilities. As the 20th century dawned, Madison's waterworks expanded rapidly. A 161-foot water tower stood guard over East Washington near Pickney. A 210-ton Alice Chalmers steam pump at Nickel Station pushed water throughout the growing city. And by the 1920s, westward expansion brought the construction of a six million gallon reservoir on Madison's near west side, forming the foundation of Reservoir Park and still serving the city today. Dozens of wells and reservoirs and hundreds of miles of water main would follow over the next eight decades. But the construction boom of the 20th century wouldn't last. I think we've definitely shifted. The first hundred years or so of, of the utility was about growth. As the city was expanding and we were putting in mile after mile of pipe, new wells. Now we're in a rebuilding phase. Conservation, slower, more compact population growth, and aging water infrastructure means the utility is now looking inward. We have to uh, replace that first generation of infrastructure. And they're turning to new technology to do it using innovative relining methods to build new pipes inside the old ones, investing millions in replacing water mains, rebuilding well facilities, and improving the quality of water. So we are now putting in uh, filtration uh, where it's needed so that we can provide the highest level of water quality. This is our second example in our system of an iron and manganese filtration system. As Madison Water Utility embarks on the next 130 years, the focus is on efficiency, sustainability, and the future. It's not an infinite resource. Uh, we have to make sure that we don't take more out of the aquifer than uh, nature is putting back in. As for the forward-thinking Madisonians who started it all more than a century ago... I think they would be amazed at the size and of the system, the technologies that are used. They would be proud of the workforce and the dedication. I don't think people need to say a little Hosanna to Magnus and John every time they step into their water closet, but it would be nice if they appreciate the fact that it was individuals in the 1880s who established a paradigm uh, that we live with today to our great success. We keep our eyes on water quality and customer service and satisfaction, and I think that uh, we'll be around another hundred years. Mm -hmm.